Geek Live. Uh, today, I'm very excited. We've got a slightly different feel to the live stream. What we're going to look at today are all of the, uh, the, the sci-fi and fantasy uh, TV shows that are coming out over the next few months. In the wake of Game of Thrones, we've got kind of like a golden age of all of these. All the different channels are bringing out their successor, uh, successor shows. And uh, my guest today is somebody who, uh, as, a, as a weekly thing goes through, or more than weekly, goes through and just reviews all of these shows and looks at uh, everything. So he's got a good idea about everything we've got coming up. Um, I will let him big himself up, though. Uh, he has been on the channel before, uh, but it was a little while ago, uh, and it's great to have him back. Uh, James, do you want to say hi? Hello, Robert. Thank you so much for having me again. And yeah, it is a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here talking about all these shows. I am fired up and ready to go. Excellent news. Uh, guys uh, in the chat, uh, great to see you there already. Um, I've, As always, I've had a few questions from my patrons, but what we're going to do today is we'll uh, go with those questions, but we're going to try and frame this around the different shows we've got coming up. We talked quite a bit last time about the... Uh, uh, the, the greenlit show is the successor show to Game of Thrones uh, being House of the Dragon. But I would love just to kick us off, James. What, what are your views? What do, you think, what do you think we can expect from House of the Dragon? Well, I loved Fire and Blood. I know some people thought it was just basically a little bit of material that we'd seen before, but just expanded. But I've got my copy right here over my shoulder. <laughs> when it came out last year, I basically sat down for two or three straight days and just gorged myself on it. And I was just having the time of my life. There's so many extraordinary characters. I'm a big fan of charismatic, unrepentant, unapologetic villains. And there's so many extraordinary characters. And just, I mean, we can talk about family dysfunction between the incest and the malformed children and the backstabbing and the betrayals. It's like every <laughs> kind of story of family stuff you've ever heard of, but with black magic and dragons and just, it's just extraordinary. And I can't wait for, I mean, I'm always hoping for the second part, but that also means he'll be spending less time writing Winds of Winter. So I'm always a little conflicted about what I want from George R. R. Martin, but there's enough material there where they could do many seasons, but obviously as written, it's like a history book. It's very decompressed. And or not, not decompressed, the show would have to be very decompressed. So how much will they focus on all these individual years? Because you're talking about centuries of storytelling. It's a bit of the problem we'll discuss with the Lord of the Rings show where they're tackling the second age. And there's like 2,900 years of events that have been summarized. And creatively, that's obviously gives you a lot of rope to hang yourself with. But I'll, I'll be all in on the House of the Dragon show when it comes out, just because I love the source material so dearly. But also, real quick, I just also wanted to kind of reemphasize what you mentioned before, how we are truly entering something resembling a golden age. I feel like both in terms of the fiction, the games, the shows, and hopefully we'll get some fantasy movies. But if you love fantasy and sci-fi, this is a hell of a time to be alive. <laughs> There's a lot of cool stuff coming our way. Absolutely. And um, just I saw in the chat Mod Mary saying, I want to see Mushroom in the series. Yeah, this is this is my my only ask for this show is we have Mushroom, who is, if you've read the books, the best character. Um, the the. The show, as I understand it, uh, from what George R. R. Martin has said, if you, he did a blog post, he's got a, it's called Not a Blog, um, he did a blog post on this, and what he was saying was that um, if you want hints about what it's about, look at the two short stories he did in a couple of uh, collections, uh, one of which was about Daemon Targaryen, the rogue prince, uh, and one of which was about the start of the Dance of the Dragons and then move on to Fire and Blood. I think that that's a very clear indication that we're not going to get the very beginning of Fire and Blood with uh, the the Aegon's invasion and and, and uh, his I mean, sisters and all the rest of it, but we're going to be we focusing in. Magor the Cruel, though, he's such a great character, but Damon obviously is an extraordinary character. And yeah, I mean, he's a holy terror while running the, the gold cloaks and his relationship with his niece who's obsessed with them. And the way his story draws to a close, I won't spoil anything, but it's as dramatic and climactic as anything in that book. So he, he's a fascinating character to, to use as a springboard for the show. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, th I think that he will be one of the main characters in this show. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Um, and uh, guys, I just uh, a lot of people are that you're getting a lot of love in the chat, by the way, James, I should probably say. Uh, for those who don't know, James has got a channel, YouTube channel called Geekin' with James Hancock. Uh, I highly recommend you. I will that speak out. in the chat right now just so people can see the profile. Yeah, so yeah <laughs> Geekin' with James Hancock. And I have a podcast called Wrong Reels. So yeah, I'm always talking about film, television, mostly genre entertainment, some art film stuff. Like I recently reviewed Parasite and uh, The Irishman and things like that. So I, I, I cover a lot of things, but on the channel, I try to keep it fantasy, sci-fi, horror, superheroes, all the fun escapist fantasy stuff. Excellent. Yeah, there's a lot of crossover in what we do here on Indie Geek. Um, let's move on. We've, we've talked about um, uh, this, the House of the Dragon, quite a bit before on, on previous live streams. So um, I'm quite keen to get us on to the other things, the kind of the, the other channels, the, the, the other networks, what they're trying to do to build on the success of Game of Thrones. And obviously the big one, the mega budget thing here, is the Lord of the Rings franchise that Amazon have got. Now, uh, James, do you want to kick us off on this one? I'm a massive Lord of the Rings fan. I've started doing Lord the of the Rings content here. Yeah. Uh, and, and I would love to hear from you what you're hoping for and expecting from this uh, this series when it emerges. Well, as most of us probably already know, it's focusing exclusively on the Second Age, which is the period that Tolkien wrote about the least but there is stuff to give you an idea of what to expect, which characters to expect, which major events to expect. And basically, if you look at the like the appendices of Return of the King and the latter part of the Cimmerillion, just basically the tail end, you get a lot about the forging of the Rings of Power and you get a lot about the fall of Numenor. And along the way, it's just an extraordinary narrative. But once again, we are talking about 2,900 years, basically from circa 500 in the second age, just when Sauron begins to stir again after Morgoth went down at the end of the first age. And that all the way up to when he gets the ring cut from his hand, that's the year 3441. So that's an enormous amount of history. And you've got all these incredible elven characters like Celebrimbor, Gilgalad, Galadriel, Elrond. Not a lot of dwarven characters by name, but obviously a lot going on in Moria with the discovery of Mithril and the relationship with the elves and how their mutual love of craftsmanship. But for me, I think the most potential comes in the Numenorean kings and queens during their rise to wisdom and power and then their, their descent into darkness as they start to try and pursue immortality as they fall under the sway of Sauron after the very in a very silly fashion decide to take him prisoner and take him home where he starts to influence everybody and you just have so much potential for so many extraordinary characters but once again like so, this is a, it's a period of incredible darkness and I don't know how bleak the show wants to go but one of the reasons like the doors of Moria get sealed is because during that period you have these little pockets that are safe obviously like you know Rivendell's home and things like that but it's a really bleak period until the Numenorians come in. But it's like you've got all these great cliffhangers where at the end of one season, it could be the arrival of the Numenorians waging war against Sauron. Or at the end of another season, it could be the downfall of Numenor being swallowed up by the sea. And at the end of another season, it could be the last alliance of elves and men. I mean, it's truly epic, but it's very thin on details. So whoever they have writing the show, I looked up the writers earlier. I know they worked on Star Trek Beyond and they're working with Matthew Vaughn on Flash Gordon, but they're largely not untested or inexperienced, but they're, they're getting their career started. They have this enormous creative opportunity in front of them. I'm just really excited to see what they cook up. Yeah, agreed. The, the, the team they've got there has got a they they released a video this kind of like here's our team and, and they showed the people in the writing room and the creative directors and all the rest of it. The team they've got around them is good. Uh, it has to be said they've got some Tolkien scholars on board as well. Um, but John the Howe as a designer. Exactly, yeah. The, the showrunners they've got, um, uh, as you say, Star Trek Beyond is the only thing that I've seen that they've done, uh, which it's probably fair to say I was underwhelmed by. That's fair. Um, and, uh, but I'm willing to give them a shot. There is so much material, and the general view is that they're uh, – the, the Tolkien estate is hugely strong on making sure that people do not go against the canon. They, that everything that happens on screen has to be fitting in with what Tolkien wrote. But as James was saying, there are huge gaps in the second age. 
there are there are so many spaces that they can make stories from and the the bits that tolkien did write about are absolutely fascinating we get effectively it's the rise and then fall of sauron we get the rise and then fall of numenor which is this amazing island nation that uh, is the the sort of the the tolkien version of atlantis this fantastically advanced wonderfully civilized place that that just basically goes corrupt over time uh, there are so many stories in there that i am really excited about this we're not going to see it though for quite a long time they've not started principal filming yet that probably won't happen in fact they've only cast two or three people so far uh, james I, I mean i know you keep on top of these things what what's your view on in terms of when we might see it or, or who, who the cast is have you got any kind of inside information about what the sort of the time scales here i can't claim to have any inside info but i can't imagine we'll see it any earlier than like 2022 i would assume or maybe late 2021 i mean it's a they spent $250 million just on the rights, and I think they're spending another – I keep reading either $250 million or another $500 million on the first season. I mean, they're just going – or first couple of seasons, there's, it's this enormous, colossal undertaking. But I have to admit that when it comes to their social media, they've been incredibly clever. And I love how they just started out with their Twitter account with the Tolkien quote, I wisely started with a map. And we just saw a map of the Middle Earth as it stood in the Second Age, but with no identifying – kind of marks or cities and things like that. And then they slowly started fleshing things out. It seems like they have this incredible, incredible reverence for what little material does exist. But sa but sadly, I do not have any inside info on a possible release date, but I would be in awe if we got it any earlier than 2021. Because it's, as you mentioned, it's just this enormous undertaking and Amazon wants their Game of Thrones. Everybody wants their Game of Thrones, but they have a real shot with this if they stick the landing. Yeah, I mean, all I know, and I, th I think all anyone knows, is that the deal that they signed meant that they had to, within two years of signing the deal, they had to start principal photography, which means that they have to start doing proper filming this year. Yeah. Now but they signed it late 2017, correct? It's exactly. So, so they have to do it this year. Now that doesn't mean that they have to be doing, uh, you know, well. To take a step back, as I said, they've only cast two or three people so far. So they are still clearly a little way away from actual proper filming. Proper filming, if you took something like Game of Thrones for a season of uh, writing and filming and then post-production before uh, they aired it, that was they did that on an annual basis. That They were really in the groove for that, and that was work, working really fast. So that is the fastest I would agree that we could possibly expect is, is is in a year, but they're not going to properly start doing this. I suspect until spring of next year. So I think 2022 is probably a good bet. I think that they're going to put a lot of time in. They want to get this right. They don't want to just rush it out. They want to get this one right. Now, quick question. And yeah. I, was, I was going through my research earlier. I was just going through like all the highlights of the second age. Do did that Tolkien ever specify? where Sauron's ring was at the time of the fall of Numenor, because at the time of the fall of Numenor, his body was destroyed and he fled back to Mordor where he started to rebuild himself. And obviously from that point on, he can no longer appear in disguise or he can no longer fear, be like fair to behold, which is part of his trick into getting everybody to get on board with the construction of the rings of power in the first place. But if his body was destroyed in Numenor, did he like, stash the ring in like Baradur before he got captured and taken away? But if it is, it's, a, it's a little missing link in the story that could be fun for them to play with. Yeah, it, it is a it is a missing link, and it's something that I I mean I always say this. There are people in the chat who know so much more than we do all the time. But as far as I'm aware, that we know that the ring was on his finger, obviously. At that battle, when we saw it was in the 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 start of the Lord of the Rings films, when Isildur cuts it off of his finger, so it, we know where it was there. That was the very end of the Second Age. Um, we know that he forged it partway through the Second Age. We do not know exactly what happened or where it was all the way th through that period. Now the implication is that, as you say, that his body was destroyed in Numenor when Numenor as a whole was destroyed. Therefore, it would seem to imply that he wasn't wearing the ring at that 
point he had stowed it away, but it's never made clear. Uh, this, I think, is is where we get into this kind of like, if Tolkien didn't say it, then they can make it up business. Perhaps he had a sidekick who uh, took it from him, realising the dangers, and then took it back so that he could pick it up when his, his body was reformed, as it Also, were. we know that the Nazgul were emerging at this time, three of whom are Numenorians. So we might see an episode yeah. where one of the Numenorians, who doesn't quite look like a ring wraith yet, but is on his way, perhaps takes the ring and takes it and stashes it. Like, But I feel like there's, a, there's so much fun stuff for them to play with. But the idea of seeing one of the Easterlings and the three Numenorians going from human to ring wraith in stages over several seasons, that alone could be so much fun to watch. Ab absolutely. And I, th I think this has to be where they are going to take it. It's something to do with a connection between the ring and the fall of Numenor and the, the rise and fall of Sauron. That has to be where it is. I think this means that they're going to do it over long periods of time, but not over crazy long periods of time. Didn't so someone say to... five seasons or something like that? Like, that was the goal? I think they've signed up for five seasons. I th that's the kind of thing where they'll be slightly flexible on it, I'm sure, depending on how well they're doing and all the rest of it. But it's like, uh, I could certainly see that they would take it up to the either the fall of Numenor or the final fall of Sauron there at the last alliance of men and elves uh, the scene that we see in the Lord of the Rings uh, at the very beginning with their kind of the flashback thing uh, I could see that happening uh, because they will want to tie it into the Lord of the Rings they don't just want to do a random fantasy thing in set in a, an island that wasn't even there during the Lord of the Rings with characters who weren't there during the Lord of the Rings. They will want to have a link across to the story that we all know. But aren't they strictly prohibited from tackling anything in the Third Age? They can't, at the unless they sign extra rights, at the moment they cannot touch the Third Age. So any Third Age things, any Third Age characters, they can't do anything with. So unless they sign some more rights, that's where we're at right now. I hope and that'll be a roaring success. They do it in five seasons, and it's such a success. They say, screw it, we're going for the first age. Because if people like the second age, <laughs> the first age is awe-inspiring. It's my, maybe my favorite epic fantasy I've ever read. And it's just, it's that, it, granted, it comes in like bits and chunks, but there's a lot more detail to sink your teeth into. And some of the stories within and some of those giant battles that they have. And it's so sad and so melancholy and so beautiful. If they could do the first, it, it would be way more expensive, but it would be something. I mean, a Amazon can afford it. I mean, Jeff Bezos, he's worth $100, million, $100 billion. <laughs> he can yeah. pay for it all by himself. So I hope we'll get the first stage at some point done right. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, and I would love to see it. I do wonder, so the the second age is, well, all of Tolkien is high fantasy. There, there are dragons out there, there are elves, there's magic and all the rest of it. The first age is very high fantasy. We're, we're talking a lot more involvement from, I was going to say, the gods of the god. Oh, yeah, pantheons um, of, of godlike exact, beings. Exactly. We, we've got huge amounts more, just very, very magical stuff going on. So I think... For me, it was the right choice to go second age. I think there are human interest stories going on there, and that is where I think they want to do. And I think they will definitely, pardon me, definitely try and make the link between the second age and the third age, so that we have this link across to the Lord of the Rings. Incidentally, we're talking about this as Lord of the Rings. I'm sure they won't call it the Lord of the Rings. I'm sure they will come up with some kind of snazzy tale. It might be Lord of the Rings colon something. But I, I think that. Uh, that we will get another title for this. Lord of the Rings, The Second Age. I mean, it's a mouthful, but it would work. I, it, it, it would. It, it would, absolutely. James Barkley, thank you so much for the super chat, saying, hope you had fun in Ambleside. I miss it so much. Yeah, I did. Uh, I was, uh, it's mostly for people who follow me on uh, Instagram. I, I, I took a weekend off in the Lake District in England, which is a beautiful part of the world um and uh, i had uh, had a fantastic time and uh, james there i know you're you used to live in ambleside which is where i uh, spent a little time wandering around which is a lovely lovely part of the world yes i did have an amazing time very relaxing thank you very much for that um just on the lord of the rings uh on patreon hypatia ravenclaw said Hi, Robert. I hope you have a one, you're having a wonderful evening. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really enjoying this. I was just interested in how old you were when you first read Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. 
And would you recommend reading the related works in the order they were published in, or maybe chronologically? Well, just in terms of when I first read it, I, I honestly can say I do not know. It was, uh, there are some things, uh, and this is true, I'm sure, for everyone, that are just such a part of you that you honestly don't know the first time that you pick them up. It's the same for me. The other thing for me is Doctor Who. I don't tend to cover that on this channel, but it's something which is just a part of me. I've always watched Doctor Who. Um, Lord of the Rings was something I've read the books. Uh, I don't know how many times when we went on family holidays, we had uh, uh, audio adaptations playing in the car on the way there. This was Very just nice. a huge part of, of who I was. Um, so I don't know what age I was when I first read them. In terms of what reading order, uh, if you've never read them, if you've just like watched the films or something like that, I think the... The best way to start, The Hobbit is such an accessible book. It is written as a children's book. It's very easy to read and it's fantastic and you know the story already. Um, the Lord of the Rings is next. It's longer. It's slightly more intense. There's lots more uh, random going off and reading a couple of pages worth of a, a song of some history. Uh, but it's also incredibly easy to read. People sometimes say go for the Silmarillion next. The Silmarillion is amazing. I would personally recommend that you try and um, uh, pick a few of the, the stories, the individual stories that they've been trying to publish uh, since then, um, uh, that uh, you can... Baron Luthien, for example, which is a fantastic story, which was published just... Uh, and just Sauron's in that ago. story, so yeah. Uh, yeah, so, and that I would t pick a few of those individual stories before you try and dig in with the... into the the Silmarillion, which is the, the law, the history, and all the rest of it. So start with The Hobbit, then Lord of the Rings, then go to some of the uh, the individual stories, and then tackle The Silmarillion would be my recommendation. But James, yeah. what, what what about I mean, you? When I first read The Silmarillion, I remember just keeping all the family trees like off to the side, and I was constantly, I was like, all right, who, who is this guy? Because you're trying to keep track of like the family of Fingon and Turgon and Fingolfin, and all that. you're just like, all right, who who is he talking about? Like, and yeah. so the first time through, you're really just playing this guessing game. But once you get used to who all the characters are, then you can really immerse yourself in it. But I feel like that first 20, 30 pages where it's just the Pantheon basically giving life to the world, you have to get over that hump. But once you do, you like once basically Theonor and his sons enter the equation and start kinsling, then it really finds that special gear. Like, oh, this is extraordinary. And you just get completely, totally addicted but yeah i saw the hobbit cartoon the, the rankin bass from the 70s small mm -hmm. child loved it saw it a million times before even i actually did a book report in fifth grade on the hobbit which i never even read at the time i just talked about the cartoon and kind of lied my way through it and then i finally read the hobbit in lord of the rings in high school and i read the cimmerillion when i was 23 or 24 and the cimmerillion is the one that i go back to the most now i mean lord of the rings one of the all-time great reads but the cimmerillion i really like the and just the information the richness of the text. It's just, I, I enjoy history written in broad strokes, like history written in lightning. And it's the best fake history book ever written, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I, th I think that you need to work up to it. But once you're there, it's like the heady wine of the, of, of this world. Um, uh, Sergeant uh, Hoddle, uh, thank you so much for the uh, super chat, saying we should watch The Witcher on Netflix. Looks good using book canon, not game. Yeah, we're going to talk about The Witcher in just one moment. So uh, so hang around for a little while about that. But yes, I agree. They do seem to be focusing more on the books than on the game. Uh, but as I say, we'll come on to that in just a moment. A few people in the chat I noticed were uh, talking about what I was going to be covering. Um, I suspect James is going to be covering most of these things. I'll talk to Hal ask you in a moment, James, about what it is. In terms of what I'm going to be covering, um, obviously I'm going to be carrying on with all of the Game of Thrones spin-offs, so House of the Dragon, when it comes out, I will definitely be covering. Lord of the Rings, I am all over. I, uh, I've i started producing Lord of the Rings uh, videos at the moment. It's once a fortnight. I'm going to start ramping that up. Hopefully soon I'll be able to be doing a, a Lord of the Rings video every week, uh, and that's more and more as a bit 
get close to the season. Um, Westworld, we're not going to talk about, but it's uh, you know how much I love Westworld. I'm going to be uh, majoring on that when season three comes out. The other things uh, that we're talking about today are things that I really enjoy and I am definitely going to be watching. Uh, at the moment, I'm not planning on covering, but uh, I'm going to leave open a little, little asterisk that if I suddenly get really excited by them, then maybe I will do a video or two on them. So that's that's the situation uh, for people saying you really should cover this or you really should cover that. My take is I want to be an expert on whatever I'm covering. So things like The Witcher, we'll get onto it in a moment. I've uh, I've read some of the books. I've played one of the games. I don't consider myself a complete expert. Maybe I will uh, uh, speed read some stuff to get up to speed beforehand. Uh, but I'm uh, I want to be an absolute expert on whatever it is I'm going to be talking about. But James, uh, are you going to be? You're going. You're going to be. I'm assuming you're going to be covering most of what we're talking about today. Yeah, I mean, if I'm reading it or I'm playing it or I'm watching it, I try to cover it if I can. We live in a really special time where there's more stuff to talk about than I have time to cover adequately. But The Witcher, I'll be all over. But like you, I don't consider myself an expert on Witcher. I read the first two collections of short stories, and I've played Witcher three. I am in love with it, but I'm still learning it. But I've got this big old whopper of a box set ready to go with the, the first three novels and another two more after that. So I'm trying to get up to speed as quickly as possible. But Last Wish and Sword of Destiny, I found deliriously entertaining. And Witcher 3 is one of my all-time favorite games. So I am, I'm just excited to have so much more material to sink my teeth into. Excellent. And a lot of people are... Um... Uh, sort of picking up on random things. Uh, I say random things. There are so many good things out at the moment. Uh, somebody was saying about, well, asking whether I've had a chance to watch Dark yet. No, I haven't. I'm finishing watching The Boys at the moment. Dark, Dark is season one and two are brilliant. Uh, like next everyone level. says this, yeah. and and this is I literally everybody I respect who watches TV and has watched it says you should watch this. You'll love it. So I will definitely be watching Dark. Still not quite had the chance to do that yeah, yet. My best performing video is my Dark Season 1 review. That's how like my, my channel started getting some, some traction. Oh, wow. I mean, I think that there are not many people who are covering it at the moment. So I think that that's... That's uh, why. My channel's small. But if you tackle something that's really cool that not a lot of people are talking about, all the traffic gets to you. So it's like, I just got lucky because I started watching it and fell in love with it. But yeah, Dark Season 1, Dark Season 2, it's like this... It's like a, a like a beautiful Swiss watch, or it's like this incredible mathematical complexity, and I give it my highest possible recommendation. Absolutely, okay, guys. Well, well, that that that's our dark thing. I I can't talk about it at all. Uh, but other than to say, lots of people I respect have told me I should be watching it. Uh, Jennifer Wood, thank you so much for the super chat. Wheel of Time, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Don't, don't worry. So uh, so hang around for that one. But I do want to talk now about turn to something that um, I, I know you've covered. I know I've read the books. Uh, many of us have seen the film, but now there is a big budget um, a new series, which has literally just started. So episode one launched uh, just last week. I'm talking about His Dark Materials. Um, so this is on, uh, if you're in the UK, it's on BBC One on Sundays and it's on the iPlayer. You can catch it there. I think it's on HBO if you're outside the UK in America. Um, but James, I know you saw episode one. Uh, I watched your sort of breakdown of that. What, for those who've read the books or for those who haven't read the books, what, what can we expect from this? Is it good? Why should we watch this? Well, so far, we've only had a small taste, but it, everything I, they, ha they haven't struck a note that feels false yet to me. And admittedly, I've read the first book and I've seen the first episode. There are people who have read the companion trilogy, the main trilogy, and have been fans of this since 1995 when it first came out. And so I'm a little hesitant to say what is true to what some hardcore fans might be expecting. But when it comes to the look of the polar bears and when it comes to the just the the casting, I did not see the 2007 film. But when I saw the show was coming our way, I said, all right, I got to up my game. I got to read the first book. And I just kind of fell into it. It's a, usually I try to avoid young adult fiction. I just I like my fantasy to have kind of sharper teeth, like Joe Abercrombie over my shoulder. I, I like my, my fantasy to be a little grimmer, a little darker. And anytime you have a child protagonist, you're probably going unless it's. Uh, what's it? Um, what's that? That story, Prince of Thorns. That's a child protagonist, but it's one of the most savage books ever <laughs> written. But 
I think James McAvoy is nailing it. And I, I'm blanking on the name of the actress who played X-23 in Logan, but she's doing such a fine job as Lyra as well. They just, they lined up an extraordinary voice talent. And I love the look of the world. Like Tom Hooper, who directed the first episode, I'm not the world's biggest fan of his movies. He did like The King's Speech and Les Mis, and he's got the upcoming Cats. But I think he did a pretty good job of setting the tone for the world. And for newcomers, you really just get to take in all this detail and learning about the demons. I think Ruth Wilson's going to do a brilliant job as, as a Mrs. Coulter. So I think, yeah, when it comes down to this first-rate British acting talent, I think they knocked that out of the park. Whether or not they'll nail like the action, more like a more kind of spectacle driven sequences remains to be seen because there is a hell of a lot of action in the latter part of the story. There, there absolutely is. And um, I would just say Ruth Wilson, I, I absolutely adore. I think she's an amazing actor. I, I just think she has so much charisma that she just like chews up the scenery all the time. Um, the So, so I, I love the books. Um, I think they're fantastic. I've I've been listening to the audiobooks again recently as well, um, and I'm very excited by this. I'm, and I'm the actual, slightly annoyed. The audiobooks are performed. They have like actual actors. You have different actors exactly. in there doing the voices. Yeah, it's like a, a, a radio production. Exactly. And uh, but I, I'm slightly annoyed that I didn't get the chance to watch episode one before doing this. Um, uh, so I'm really glad that you did. And it looks like a lot of people in the chat also did, and seem it seems to be getting quite a very positive. Uh, response at the moment from people who love the books, which is always a good sign. Uh, Maura Lee, uh, thank you so much for the super chat there, saying a great live stream. We'll watch the rest later on catch up. Thank you, James and Robert. Uh, and you did a, a super chat and a super sticker before we went live as well, Maura. Thank you so much. And you know how much I appreciate your support, saying just my usual love and support for all the fabulous content. Miss hearing the stories on the well-told tale and thoroughly enjoying uh, your Traveller's Guide series, which I look forward to every Friday. Love your channel very much. Maura, thank you so much. Uh, the um, slight digression, the well-told tale, uh, I know I've not done anything on it for a, a few weeks now. This is because I'm about to do a relaunch on The Well Told Tale. Uh, it's going to be exactly the same idea. This is just going to be me reading what I consider to be the finest uh, science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. It is just an audiobook channel, but I'm relaunching it as a podcast as well. Um, hopefully, it's going to be slightly slicker. Hopefully, it's going to be a little bit better audio quality. We're going to get a little bit more. Um, uh, sort of uh, slightly better graphic design and all the rest of it. But basically, if you wait till later this month, there will be a complete relaunch of that. So uh, thank you so much for the kind words. It will be returning. Um, Maury, also you asked over on Patreon about uh, His Dark Materials, or you're saying uh, that you saw the first episode um, and hoping that the TV show will be better than the movie. Yes, absolutely. I agree that the movie was a missed opportunity. Um, it has to be said. Um, uh, I'm familiar with the books. Um, what do you think just, um, I assume you saw the movie. Did you see the movie, James? I did not. Cause I remember at the time people were just bashing it saying that it didn't have faith in the qualities that make the book great in the first place. And that always bewilders me when you see a show or a, sh or a show or a movie, that doesn't understand what makes something innately appealing in the first place. And then they try to embellish it or smooth it over. They almost try to make it more accessible. And so, yeah, when it came out in 2007, I was curious until I saw just this massive pushback. I was like, all right, well, maybe I ought to just take a crack at the book. So I, I like to read. I'm not completely illiterate. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad I waited and just got to experience the novel firsthand because it was an absolutely delightful read. Yeah. So the, the, the film, from my perspective, I know a lot of people absolutely hated on it. The film, from my perspective, was an okay film, but uh, the, the problem was that the books were so good and they just missed so much of the, the subtlety and the nuance um, uh, that, and it was very kind of bright and Hollywoody. And the books have got a level of grittiness about them. Um, that looks from the trailers as if it will be transferred into this TV show. They're, I mean, it's young a adult, but it's a scary world. I mean, it's a world Absolutely. dominated by an authoritarian theocracy where children are being abducted. I mean, it's a scary place. And that I think a lot of people will, will be surprised by if they're expecting like a Harry Potter story. It's much more alarming when you read it. And it's not heavy handed in its messaging, but there's definitely 
I don't want agenda is the wrong word, but the writer has certain preoccupations, but he explores them in a really interesting fashion. But then if you don't necessarily like the messaging, you still have giant polar bears in armor fighting each other, like all those incredible stuff. So yeah, I strongly, strongly recommend it. There's a reason why it's so beloved 25 years later. And James McAvoy, I think is the biggest fan of all. Apparently he, he read these books and never dreamed he would actually get to play Lord Azrael, but here he is. Yeah, and I have to admit, I'd never thought of him as Lord Azrael. That's a, that's a very different casting to what I imagine. So I'm looking forward to because he's a good actor, uh, and I'm sure he'll do a great job. But it's like when, oh, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. I think that um, uh, I will be really interested in seeing where that is. And it's got a quite a big, so um, uh, what, what, what's his name? Uh, is, is Lee Scoresby, the guy who did uh, Hamilton, um, Lynn... Miranda, oh, and he's name? the guy who also is working on the um, the King Killer Chronicles as well. Didn't he, didn't he? Wasn't he attached to the show or the movie that got canceled? I'm I'm totally blanking on his name, but I know he was trying to get it, uh, trying to get it up and running. Hang on, let me do a quick IMDb. Uh, Lin Manuel Miranda, I think, isn't it? Hundred percent. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. So so I, I'm intrigued by the King Killer Chronicles. This is Patrick Rothfuss. Uh, the stories. Um, people keep on mentioning this to me as a, a thing which is in development. What What do you know? Because you, just I know that it's a show and a movie, both of which have struck a reef. I know Sam Raimi was attached to the film, but is no longer. And I know I can't remember if it was going to be a movie, then a season, or a season, then a movie. But obviously, there've been two books so far. I've got the first one right here, ready to go, but I've not read it. But I keep hearing it's one of the all-time great fantasy novels. And I know that. There's an adversarial relationship between the author and his fans because they've been waiting quite some time for the uh, for the <laughs> final book. And, Remind uh, you of anyone? That should sound familiar to a lot of your listeners and a lot of your viewers who love GRRM. So I, because it's a whopper of a book, I'm probably going to wait until I hear some news about either a show or a movie coming, and then I'll dive right in. But my understand every time I see a list of like the top ten fantasy books ever written, more often than not, that book pops up. So yeah, I mean, I've read the first book, um, King. Killer Chronicles, uh, and it was very good, I have to say. Um, uh, my understanding is that the TV show is still in early days. Uh, I know a few people in the chat are sort of like going, what, hang on, I've not heard about it. It's very early days. And the idea is that they're not actually adapting the books. They're doing stories from a, effectively like a prequel to the books. Gotcha. That's my understanding of it, but it's very early days. So we can't actually say huge amount about that yet, but this may be in a few years time, this may happen. It's on one of those things that you keep on hearing is about to maybe happen. One like wheel of time. It took 15 years for that thing to exactly. finally get really underway. Cause they've been talking about it for yeah, since the early two thousands as, as a show at this point. And we will be talking about the wheel of time a lot uh, in a little bit. Um, uh, so uh, let's, um, Let's move on to something that um, so Maura Lee also was talking about, uh, The Mandalorian. Now, um, this uh, saying uh, Helen and Kyle, this is uh, two of my uh, my friends, Kyle, uh, Azora Hype, Helen, the Clueless Fangirl. Um, they've been doing a, a few podcasts about this. The Mandalorian is the first live action Star Wars TV series and it is going live very soon I think on Tuesday the 12th. yeah Tuesday so it's very very soon um could you just give us the background so I, I'm assuming there are a lot of people who like me love Star Wars love the movies some of them more than others obviously but we may have read one or two of the books uh, but haven't ever really gotten into the wider expanded universe. What what could we expect from this? What what is the Mandalorian? Uh, I mean, this is basically just ripped straight from Wikipedia. But set five years after Return of the Jedi, some people suspect that the character played by Werner Herzog might be someone who helps establish the First Order. That we might see some of the seeds being planted. But obviously, there's a, a a decent chunk of time between episode six and episode seven. And so they've got a lot of room to play with, but it's eight episodes, unreal cast. I think Pedro Pascal is phenomenal. Obviously people will remember him from game of Thrones, but he was really good in Kingsman golden circle. I think he's a really talented actor and funny as hell, but he's basically playing a mix between like a samurai and Clint Eastwood running around collecting bounties. And the first trailer I thought was pretty good. The second trailer gave me goosebumps. I just couldn't believe how cool it was. As soon as I saw him, 
freeze one of his bounties in carbonite. I was like, all right, I'm so in that I can't even put it into words. Gina Carano, MMA pioneer, such a badass. Carl Weathers, you know, lifelong fan. You got Taika Waititi in there. But then you look at some of the people writing and directing, like obviously the Star, Star Wars community is fractured these days in terms of what different camps want from it. But it seems like everybody can agree that Dave Filoni really gets Star Wars and kind of embodies what Star Wars is all about. And the fact that he's, I think he's writing one episode and directing two. Hang on, I wrote this down. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, he's directing episodes one and five and writing episode five. And you have Taika Waititi directing episode eight. I mean, the talent that's involved is extraordinary. And I know another one of the directors is going to be involved in, uh, oh, there's, I think her name is Deborah Chow. She's doing something else. Oh, she's doing the Obi-Wan Kenobi show. She's um, one of the directors on that. So if you want to get an idea of what the Obi-Wan Kenobi show might be like, check out her episodes on The Mandalorian. But I have fallen out of love in recent years with Star Wars. But as soon as I saw this trailer, I felt like, a kid again and like you know playing knights of the old republic or watching empire strikes back it for me it embodies all it hit all the right notes that i want from star wars yeah i think i agree with that completely if you've not watched the trailer do go and watch the trailer this is um this is the big thing for when the disney channel launches uh this is what they're pinning a lot of their hopes on and it does look good uh the the overall feel as i understand it is that so this is after as you said it was five years after return of the jedi so the empire has fallen but suddenly not everything is beautiful and wonderful we just get this power vacuum uh and uh you get the the rebel alliance are trying to form this wonderful republic you still get some splinter bits of the empire out there. You get this kind of wild west feel to what we've the, the, to the galaxy effectively, and into that we have this show where we have the Mandalorian and and Mandalore is this uh, I think it's a moon rather than a planet, but uh, we saw it very briefly I think on one of the uh, the, the, the uh, prequel. Uh, films. This is so Boba Fett is a Mandalorian. They are this kind of like race of mercenary slash uh, bounty hunter types. And this is the world, this is the galaxy into which this, the, the Mandalorian character who we have is going to be pitched, trying to work their way through uh, a, a universe, a galaxy which is divided and lawless in many ways. And so that is the kind of feel we've got there. It, 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 it seems quite a bit like, um, uh, and I hope it's a lot like Firefly in as much as this is kind of like moving from planet to planet with this kind of slightly lawless feel, lots of different um, uh, sort of powers all over the place. Some people trying to bring order, some people enjoying the fact that there's not much order. That's the kind of feel we've got going on here. So um, I'm really excited about this. I don't know uh, how or when I'm going to see it, if it's on the Disney Channel. I've, I haven't got that yet, but... Uh, I, yeah, I've subscribed, but yeah, for me... I just hope it'll be something like the good, the bad, and the ugly, but with laser guns where you've got like chaos and war all around. But obviously Clint Eastwood's character in that, he's a bounty hunter and he's kind of a slime ball and he's well, kind of unreliable and he's dealing with other unsavory characters. And I love it when Star Wars explores these unsavory characters, whether it's the Cantina sequence or characters like Lando or Han or whomever. That side of Star Wars, I feel like has been underdeveloped. So bring on the rogues, bring on the smugglers, bring on the bounty hunters, bring on all the ne'er-do-wells. I'm really excited to see those characters in action. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Lovich in the chat, there's always people who know more than us. Boba himself was a clone of a bounty hunter who actually wasn't Mandalorian. So there we go. Uh, that That's where it, but the, uh, if you look at the, the main, the Pedro Pascal uh, um, kind of armor, it has got that same kind of Boba Fett feel to it. That's so that's the, the kind of the ethos that they're going to going for is this, uh, is this kind of like bounty hunter mercenary kind of feel in a, a slow, lawless galaxy. Um, uh, we're about uh, 45 minutes in, so nearly coming up to halfway. What I always do halfway through my uh, my live streams is just to let people know stuff that's happening on my channel, um, stuff that they might be able to look forward to. So if you've not seen it already, I did a video 
couple of days ago, uh, a Song of Ice and Fire video on who wrote the pink letter, which is one of the, well, I think, one of the big unanswered questions that we're waiting for an answer from in the winds of winter. It's, uh, it's a letter that in the books, it changed everything for Jon Snow because he was about to head off to hard home, uh, but actually he suddenly changed his mind and said, you know what, I'm going to leave the Night's Watch, I'm going to head down, I'm going to take on Ramsay Bolton uh, at Winterfell, and that was what got him killed. So this was a hugely important letter. That letter was the thing which changed the course of what happened at Castle Black. Now, there are lots of theories out there about who who might have written this because it doesn't seem to have been Ramsay Bolton himself. Uh, so if you're interested in that, please do go and check that one out. This is the, the next in a series of videos that I'm doing, looking forward to the winds of winter. So I'll be doing a few more um, over the course of the next few weeks, just trying to answer some of the questions uh, that are there that we're looking for answers from in terms of uh, the winds of winter. So I'll be looking at uh, how John might be resurrected in the books, for example. Um, I'm also working on the next thing in my Robert's Rebellion series. If you're enjoying that, um, uh, that will be coming soon. And as I say, please keep an eye out for um, the relaunch of The Well-Told Tale, uh, which will be coming later this month. The other thing I always say, because I always mean it, is patrons, thank you. I cannot do what I do without your support. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, $10 patrons, I will be coming to you uh, at some point in the next few days asking for um, your thoughts on what videos I should be covering in a couple of my different series. So that's one of the perks of being a $10 patron is you get, you get a chance to influence what videos I make in the future. Uh, so please do keep an eye out for that. If you're interested in being a patron, either just because you want to support the channel or because you want to get access to some exclusive benefits, I do just for my patrons. There's a link down in the description. Uh, but James, also, I'd be interested to know what is it that you've got coming up over the next few weeks that you think people might be interested in over on your channel? I'm cranking out a lot of my podcast, Wrong Real, which is basically long form conversations about film history on a variety of topics, like wh whether it's film composers, great writers, or, you know, great series, but a lot of filmography episodes and that sort of thing. And we crank out anywhere from like four to seven episodes a month. And then on my channel, I'll be it's pretty much, I mean, obviously talking about Star Wars and Cats and like all the big, like the remaining movies this year. But the biggest thing I'm most excited about, The Expanse season four <laughs> on Amazon. I love The Expanse. I recently finished the eighth book, so I'm all caught up and ready to go. I've read a couple of the novellas as well. And I, I loved and adored the first three and seeing the fan community rally around that show and essentially like scream for its for a savior and see Amazon swoop in and grab it was a very cool thing just in pop culture last year. It was probably my favorite like happy moment for pop culture in general because it is a franchise that deserves a larger audience. And for people out there who are frustrated, perhaps with some of the older franchises that are going in directions where they're unsatisfied, here we've got a brand new franchise, great books, great show that you can sink your teeth into, and it's, it's it breaks entirely new ground, and it's some of the best world building in sci-fi that I've come across in quite some time. So yeah, The Expanse in December, I'm all over it. Excellent. I have to say The Expanse is, with the possible exception of Dark, the show that people have been trying to encourage me most to be making videos about. Um, I I have tried, <laughs> I will honestly say, I've tried a couple of times. I watched the first episode of The Expanse. Um, uh, maybe I was a little bit tired when I watched it. Um, it didn't immediately grab me, but again, people I know and respect have recommended it, tell me it, get, it, gets, it gets really good. And it's based, I know, on some uh, very highly rated books as well. So, uh, so yeah. perhaps I will try again. Um, they were uh, former assistants of GRM. He helped them get their start, and but they write more quickly than he does. The ninth and final <laughs> book is coming out next year. So they are because they want to move on to the next trilogy, but they are also involved in the show as executive producers. So their fingerprints and their kind of their stamp of approval is on it. But Amazon's got enough material to play around with for many years to come. Um, yeah, I. I, I think so. I, I think, and I think that it's it maybe it's something that I just binge one, say one day over a week or so, um, and I just work my way through it all. Um, just grab uh, the first but, book; it's a really fun read. Yeah, just grab that first book, and it's also for sci-fi, kind of terrifying at times. So, 
Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, another person I, I I respect telling me to uh, to to get into it. So uh, maybe I should. Um, the, the pink letter. I've got a few people in the chat talking about my pink letter video. Um, uh, people saying uh, somebody I can't remember who it was saying uh, why didn't Bowen Marsh write it? Is there any reason why he didn't? Um, it's uh, yeah. I, I agree that that. The, Anyone at the wall would have known how John might react to the letter. That's absolutely true. But I think we need to understand motivations on this one. It's uh, as well as all the clues that it was written. I, I always do this. I spoil my own videos. You should watch the video, but you should uh, um, uh, the 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 letter very clearly has a number of clues within it that I think it was Mance Raider who wrote it. Um, and if the members of the Night's Watch uh, had wanted to kill John, I don't think that there was any reason for them to come up with some trumped up random letter to do so. They could have just very easily cornered him in the dark and killed him. So I don't think that there's actually any particular motive for, for any members of the Night's Watch to be doing it. Uh, I think that there are particular motives for other people to be doing it. Um, uh, but that's something a couple of people have been asking, so I'm very happy to clear that up. Uh, Jennifer Wood, uh, thank you so much for the super chat, saying off to see Dwight Yoakam, uh, who I don't really know, uh, but uh, enjoy that. Uh, we'll see the repeat on your Wheel of Time uh, thoughts. Uh, thank you both. Um, yeah, we'll get onto Wheel of Time in a moment. I think what we'll do first is look at uh, The Witcher. Now, The Witcher is something, again, a lot of people have been asking if I'm going to be covering. I thought very carefully about this, and I, I will definitely be watching it. Um, could you... So most people know that The Witcher is... Uh, obviously, it's the video games. Uh, there's a series of books... What what could we expect from the TV show? My understanding is that they are leaning heavily on the source material as opposed to the games. And it's a weird thing where I think maybe most fans know it from the games. And like I said before, Witcher 3 is one of my favorite games I've ever played. In particular, the the DLCs, it just keeps getting better and better. And just the gameplay is extraordinary. The cinematic, the, 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 the storytelling, the sexual intrigue. I mean, you get to make love on the back of a stuffed unicorn at one point. I mean, it's, it's wild. It's like adult fantasy for people who enjoy their fantasy to uh, you know, have blood and guts and sexual intrigue and all that good stuff. It's just fantastic. But with so much literature available, I think they took the wise approach in tackling the books first. Like I said, I've only read the first two short stories, one of which is The Sword of Destiny, which details the introduction of the character Siri, who is a... a, a a girl who is intended to be a princess who's living with the dryads who eventually goes through witcher training and she's a major character in the games as well that of course you have the sorceress yennefer who Geralt of rivia is totally obsessed with and in love with and they've got a pretty hot and heavy romance off and on but obviously this is a dark fantasy world where witchers are kind of hated and feared in spite of providing a useful service of hunting down monsters and protecting villages and that sort of thing and the witcher training allows them certain abilities like to see in the dark or heightened reflexes, but he uses a lot of elixirs to take his abilities even higher. And he specializes in certain creatures, but he's also got a code where he won't kill intelligent creatures. He doesn't want to, and what that line, the ethical line gets him into trouble sometimes because people say, well, I just want you to get rid of this. It's bothering my village. But he was like, well, those, you have to negotiate with them. Like and you have to use diplomacy. They're not just some random creature that needs to be, Dispatch. So I, I like all the ethical considerations, but it's also really cynical and really mean spirited and funny at times. It's 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 not kids, but it's not kids stuff at all. And I just hope that they are true to the tone of the books, because obviously, if they're not, they will deal. I mean, I feel like every show or movie now has the risk of a giant culture war to kind of erupt around it in terms of the discussion. And sometimes if there's a beloved series out there, just defer to the strengths of the source material and you'll probably do okay. And But uh, Siri, Yennefer, and Geralt are obviously the key characters. And so far from what I've seen in the trailers, like the, the action looks awesome. It looks beautiful. Like the, the latest trailer really sold me on their overall vision. Yeah, I agree. The, the trailers are looking pretty amazing. Uh, Captain Anopheles, thank you so much for the super chat, saying, check out Gogol on Amazon gives a Witcher vibe. Horror fantasy set in 1828 Ukraine. English subtitles also very funny sometimes. I hadn't uh, I hadn't come across that before, but I will check it out. Thank you so very much cool. for that. 
Are you? Do you know it? I'm unfamiliar. Yeah, but it sounds right up my alley. Excellent. Well, we'll both have a look for it. Thank you so much, Captain Anopheles. Um, in terms of the the Witcher, yeah. So uh, I've read the first three books. I played Witcher three, so I I know some things about this world. Um, not going to claim to be an expert, but where we're at with it is that. Um, or where I'm at with it is that I, when I went into it, and I suspect this is probably the same for most people with the books, uh, to start with your thinking that this is going to be a bit Conan-ish. We get this character who's like this incredible fighter. He doesn't say much. Um, he doesn't really have much by way of emotion. He's there just killing monsters, and that seems to be the story. But the more you get into it, actually, it is quite multi-layered. Because, as you say, first of all, you discover that he's actually got this code about who he will and will not kill. Um, he doesn't want to be killing humans, for example. Um, and yet we find increasingly these monsters that he sent out to destroy are not just these evil baddie monsters. Uh, then you get you get this extra level that you start to realize that actually he's not really the main character in this. The main character really is Siri, who's this um, sort of effectively this she's the child of prophecy. And then suddenly you start looking uh, at the Witcher uh, at Geralt as being yes, he's the main point of view character, but he's actually there as a supporting character in a much greater story. Um, and then you start looking at the world itself, and there are there are layers there as well about how people are viewed and about uh, prejudice uh, and and about minorities and about um, uh, when you get one culture that is hugely more powerful than another culture, what happens there? And you start getting these extra layers just sort of working their way in. So. What I'm hoping is that the show doesn't just go down this kind of like hack and slash isn't doesn't this look really cool on all the people really sexy kind of approach. I want that because I like it, but I want it to have this extra layer of critique of the world that all good fantasy and science fiction does that actually takes uh, takes a look at our own world through this created world that that you have there. I mean. With, was that something you took with these kind of extra layers from, from these books? Well, one of the stories that really caught me off guard with how incredible it was was uh, the first story in the second book, uh, The Bounds of Reason, which is a story where they're hunting a gold dragon, which most people don't even think exists. And you have all these different factions that are part of this wandering band that are there for different reasons. So they're having this pretty intense, fierce debate amongst themselves as this dragon does finally show up and they start – taking it on one at a time, basically challenging it to duels in honorable fashion. And I just couldn't believe how entertaining it was, but Geralt doesn't really participate in the action so much, but he definitely is like moving the levers of kind of like people's points of view. And I, I just, it really surprised me. And I just like how he takes things like dragons and sorcerers, et cetera, and completely deconstructs them and reinvents them because fantasy can get very derivative. And he made it all feel so fresh and so new. And he reinvigorated with all these new perspectives. So he makes fantasy feel incredibly modern. And I think probably a lot of authors have been influenced as a result. But yeah, he's got other stories like Something More where Siri is. That's the last story in the second book, which I loved. Sword of Destiny is a great story from the second book. So I just really enjoyed it. But I hope we'll see some dandelion in the show. So far, it appears as if he's maybe not going to be employed. But uh, what I saw that was uh, very encouraging, one of the producers, Lauren Schmidt Hisrich, said, or she's the showrunner, originally they were just going to do a movie. And she said, well, there's so much material out there. It would be a huge disservice to the material. Why not build it a giant world? So it seems as if she really loves and appreciates what Andrzej Sapkowski created. And so I I'm really putting all my hopes and prayers in her that she's going to really deliver something special. Yeah. And, and I think that, uh, so Dandelion, for those who don't know, is, is, is a fantastic character. He's this, he's this bard. He's uh, Geralt's best friend, effectively he sort of hangs around and, and bigs him up all the time and, and has a huge ego, but is very amusing and then, and, and has a lot of charisma about him. Um, my understanding is he is going to be in the show. Um, he might not have the name Dandelion. That's, uh, a, a, again, as I understand it, a slight mistranslation from the original Polish. Oh, gotcha. Um, okay. 
So uh, there is going to be a character, but I think that it was Buttercup, perhaps. Again, people in the chat, I suspect, will be able to give me the exact right name. But he, the character is going to be in there, but perhaps not with the name that we're expecting. Um, Kathy Stark uh, over on Patreon was saying, uh, since the trailers for the new Witcher series look so good, I've started listening to the audiobooks so good. Um, yeah, I agree. So the 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 the, uh, the video games are excellent. So as I say, I've played uh, Witcher Three, which is a fantastic video game. Um, but I don't think it really does justice to the world. The world is so much bigger. The world and and the character of Geralt is a lot more nuanced than you might originally think because the, the the problem that they have and i'll be very interested to see how they deal with this and i love your taking a moment james is that so Geralt he has to, to become the witcher he has to take all of these kind of like drugs and poisons and effectively has to be kind of reborn as a, as a different and uh, a superhuman um and this takes away huge amounts of his emotion so if you've seen on the the video games then he he seems quite an emotionless kind of character um a little bit monosyllabic um uh, definitely quite monotone um that doesn't really work very well on a tv show when that's your main character and obviously the only huge star that they've got here is henry cavill um how, how do you see that working with Geralt as being because he is he's the not Mandalorian's the got a similar new. issue because I know they're going for that man with no name like you know people who don't speak often but when they do they say speak with purpose yeah. you have to obviously have an incredibly expressive actor who communicates a lot with their eyes but Henry Cavill he was so good in the latest Mission Impossible movie and I feel like he's perhaps been underutilized I feel like he's got dimensions that have not necessarily been fully explored by some of the movies he's appeared in I know he's taking it very seriously read the stories, loves the game. He got, he said in the best shape of his life. It sounds like from what I've seen in the trailer, he's almost imitating the character from the game, but Clint Eastwood got away with that for decades. Just <laughs> kind of growling. So I hope they'll capture some of that. But if, like you said, they're going to slowly build toward him being more of an observer of these great, great events, perhaps that monosyllabic approach might work if they're going to shine a spotlight on some of the other characters. I, I guess it's all in the execution because in theory, it should be able to work just fine. Yeah, I, I'm, I think I'm a little biased because I'm rooting really hard for the show and I, kind of whatever approach they <laughs> do, I just I want it to work. And so I just, I, right now, I, I refuse to believe that they're going to drop the ball until I see some evidence otherwise. Yeah. Uh, Cara of Starfall in the chat saying, uh, Dandelion is called Yaskia or Jaskia in the TV show. So there you go. Is that so the original is... Polish name, perhaps? I or... think so. I think so. Um, but I will, uh, I will defer to others on that. So the character is definitely going to be there. Uh, nice. it's, the, it's the name that we do not know. Um, let's move on. So Jerry uh, Grushed, I always mispronounce your name, Jerry. Apologies. Um, was wanting to hear us talk not just about The Witcher, but also The Wheel of Time. Now, a few people earlier in the chat were asking about The Wheel of Time, uh, and I know this is something that you're – you're very much into so i think i'll just I'll, I'll hand it over to you just to start so for those who don't know what is the wheel of time uh and after that what is the show what can we expect from it? wheel of time probably safe to say it's the most popular fantasy series of the last 30 years i think it's sold like 85 million copies at this point i have read everything up through the first book that was written by brandon sanderson but it's I believe it's 15 books total, but if you count the prequel, perhaps it's 16. It's either 15 or 16 total. But when I was 18, a senior in high school back in the 90s, the first six books were available. I just fell into them. It, initially, it seems very intimidating when you see just these like books. I mean, these doorstoppers of books. They're like the size of phone books, like a thousand pages. But as soon as you start reading The Eye of the World, it's very pleasurable, very relaxing, very enjoyable reading. And you find yourself not being intimidated by the length. You're like, I want more, I want more. And so th those first six came along in a very important time in my just development. And I just was completely, totally consumed. And then I took a long break till like 2006, where I read book seven through Knife of Dreams, which I believe Knife of Dreams is either 10 or 11. I think it's 11. 
And then just a couple months ago, I finally read The Gathering Storm. So I've got books, I've got the final two books by Brandon Sanderson, but I guess for a long time, I was so hesitant to read the final books because Robert Jordan died while writing it. And Brandon Sanderson, who's the world's biggest fan and a massive fantasy writer in his own right, really took it seriously and took what existing materials out there and shaped and crafted an ending. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what he's all about. But the world, it's a world basically where magic has been tainted. And if men use it, they go insane. And there's this prophecy about a dragon returning, but the dragon is a man who might bring about the the end of the world by, by virtue of this taint that was put in there originally by the Dark One. So you have all these really strong female sorceresses that use the one power, and Rosamund Pike plays Moiraine, who basically comes into a village, and she finds all these taverns, and these, these characters around which like the pattern is kind of, like their presence bends the pattern to its will, and they all have different destinies and different fates. And there's so many brilliant characters. I mean, Matt Calthon, he's he's incredible. Perrin's incredible. I mean, it, there's dozens of extraordinary speaking roles. The action's incredible. The villain, so many great villains, so many great. It's, it's a delightful series. It's probably the most ambitious fantasy series ever written. So Amazon's got their work cut out for them, but the books are so long. Even like Daniel Green, he's a YouTube channel I really admire, and you should definitely have Daniel Green on if you haven't already, but he, he's read the whole series many times over, and he's the first to admit that you could strip away some characters and some, some plots. It doesn't have to be as long for a show, but at a minimum, it's going to be somewhere between like seven and ten seasons if they want to even hope to do justice to all the text that's there. Yeah, so these are big books. So there are 12, I think, Um where I come from, I can remember I read the first three. They didn't really work for me, I have to say. Um, uh, they uh, they're good, um, and in many ways they're they're really easy to read. Um, but uh, I think at the time uh, that I think we got up to like book nine or eight or nine or something like that, and he was slowing down. And I thought, I'll just wait till he finishes them all and then read them from beginning to end. And as you say, it was the classic that he got to nearly the end of the penultimate book and then he died and never finished it. And thankfully, Brandon Sanderson came in and finished a lot of them. Now, uh, I am really intrigued by this because it's got a good cast from what I've seen. Rosman Bruce Pike, Bolton's in said, there. Oh, yeah, exactly. Got, yeah, he's playing the, the Rand's father. Yeah, the guy who they, they just announced the casting of, uh, he played the guy who played Bruce Bolton on Game of Thrones. So they've got a good cast coming along. Again, it's going to have a big budget from Amazon. So it looks like it may well, uh, it may well be good. Um, I, I'm, I'm on the fence on this one. I'm going to wait and see what it looks like in the trailers. I think that they're still just about to start filming. I think they've, they've written it now. They're just doing the final bits of casting, and then I think they're starting to film at the moment. So we're not going to see it for another year or so anyway. Um, but it's um, – as a story, I th for me, and I, I know you're more of a fan of this than me, so I'd love to hear your pushback against this. Some elements felt a little derivative from Tolkien. A lot of the books of the fantasy stories around that time were very much in the shadow of Tolkien, having – Trollocs where there were trolls and their ogrins or whatever when there were ogres. Um, but other elements felt as if it was an attempt to do something different, like this idea so that the women were in control of the power and in control of the magic in a way that... The magic system is incredibly complex. Exactly. And, and in the way that in Tolkien is very much a male-centric thing, uh, there's a very much a shift over to a more female focus. Um, so it, it was quite a mixed bag for me, and I would love to see what they can do with it. If they can take the bits that worked well, then I think that that might make a really amazing series. And as, and as you say, cut out a lot of the extra bits. I may well have imagined this, but somebody once told me that there was a, um, a book nine or ten, I think it was called something like Midnight at the Crossroads. There were so many different uh yeah, threads of story twilight, i believe is that one yeah the 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 one book massive 800 page book barely covered a whole day uh, of actual story time moving forward because there were so many different things going there are definitely on definitely chapters where it's like oh this whole chapter is just about somebody walking across a camp and thinking about their day and it's like you're about to die like finish the <laughs> <laughs> robert jordan he did write his ending and he 
wrote a little bit of his beginning, but instead of doing one final book, as in Brandon Sanderson stretched it out into three, but at least he did commit to paper his idea of it. So we do have the official ending. And I don't, I always worry that George R. R. Martin has not thought ahead enough to actually put at least like an outline down. Cause I just, I worry that he's going to move on to writer heaven and we'll never know how the story really ends because he's so busy with other shows and other books and so on and so forth. And I, I, it's horribly cruel to say somebody don't pull a Robert Jordan. Uh, it's, it's very, <laughs> it's very insulting to say this, but he's not a young man and he's not a healthy man. So uh, it, it, I just, I just worry we're, we're seeing another Robert Jordan scenario in the making, but if they can just get yeah. the show to the end of Lord of chaos and do it right. The final battle at the end of Lord of Chaos is one of the most thrilling experiences I've ever read on, in any series. It was so satisfying, so violent. It just, it was so grand and so extraordinary. It all just comes together so perfectly. And then, you know, kneel or you will be knelt. I mean, the line still gives me goosebumps. If they can just get there, I'll be, ha I'll be happy. They can forget about seven through 11 where it gets a little more decompressed. <laughs> Yeah, so so I, I think of all the ones we've been talking about, this is the one that could be great, uh, but it does have to have very good writing. I think I think they need to have people who adapt it well. Um, let's move on, though. We've got uh, a, a lot of people suggesting other things. I've tried to focus this one in on uh, new shows, shows that haven't started yet rather than things that are already out there. Um, uh, but I, I did get uh, what I thought was a really good sort of conceptual question uh, from uh, over on Patreon from uh, Christian Isadoro uh, saying, hi, Robert and James. I'm hoping the two of you can discuss the, re the recent homogenization of some television and film. Television in recent years has become more cinematic with epic dramas like Game of Thrones and Westworld. And some of the largest blockbusters in cinema are tending towards a sequential format, making franchises like the Avengers uh, bringing incredible success. What do you think about this? So um, I, th I think this is a fantastic point. I'd not really thought about this before, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, James. Do you think that we are moving towards films and, uh, and TV shows being quite similar? It's a fierce debate right now. And obviously, like Steven Spielberg brought up this idea recently. If you make a movie for Netflix, should it be eligible for an Oscar or for an Emmy? Like, what is a movie on streaming? And what's the difference between a really cool show on Netflix versus what Marvel's doing, where you're basically going to the theater to see the latest episode of a show called the Marvel Cinematic Universe? So the lines between what separates cinema and television are very blurry. Whereas like back in the 80s, if you made a movie for television, it was almost like an embarrassment. Oh, like he, it's a, it's a made-for-TV movie. But now it's like a compliment. And when you see directors like Nicholas Winding Refn doing things like Only God Forgives on Amazon, which is probably more ambitious artistically than any quote-unquote art film you might see in the theater this year, clearly a lot of the, 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 the best talent is going over to that format. But when it comes to this, the serialization of movies, Marvel is a great success story. And obviously the Fast and the Furious movies have been able to succeed a little bit with the shared universe. But you look at DC, like their biggest hit of the year is not even part of that shared universe. Joker, I mean, it's probably going to gross a billion dollars, but it's a standalone movie. So I, there are not as many success stories with serialization or shared universes as perhaps people would like to believe, but Marvel casts such a long shadow. It just makes it seem like that format's so robust, but like the, the, um, the, was it the dark universe over at universal with all the classic monsters that totally failed after the first movie. It's easier said than done, but I'm all for it. I feel like it's all this moving image, it's sight and sound and whatever format you want, small screen, big screen, serialization or standalone. It's all about great stories artfully told, but I think we'll increasingly see a situation where whether it's in the cinema or in the or at home, there's really no distinction. Distinction. Like I went to the New York Film Festival, and you see Netflix movies like The Irishman playing on the big screen, but it is a Netflix movie. So, is it a movie? Is it a show? Like I don't know. Or is it something? Do we need to come up with a new term to pr properly ca categorize it? But in the end, what matters is great storytelling, visual storytelling, and whether it's TV or film. I feel like people get lost in the categorizations too much, and I. I Spielberg should probably maybe let that fight die. Like, honestly, who cares whether something's eligible, eligible for an Emmy or the Academy Awards? Their cultural relevance seems to be less and less with, with each passing year. Yeah, I think I agree completely. And I think that the, the, the blurring of the lines between TV and cinema is, is going to happen increasingly. And, and it's the noticeable thing is where the 
where the stars come from. You look at uh, people like uh, the, the, the people who were in Game of Thrones, they became stars through the TV show, and then they're going off and doing films, but they're never going to do a thing as big as Game of Thrones again, probably. So it's that the, there's the biggest budget TV now is bigger budget than uh, most films. I, we, I mean, Lord of the Rings is like, as bigger Rings. budget as like Endgame. It's crazy. Exactly. And that was so they paid quarter of a billion, as I understand it, for the rights, quarter of a billion budget for the the uh, the show itself. So we're talking about half a billion dollars just to be making that, which is just a ridiculous amount of money. So, uh, yes, there will be more blurring. And I think that there will also be, as you say, there will be like a what does it matter where people see this stuff. HBO very clearly are wanting people to watch things on their channel because of all the reasons. That's why they weren't putting things out into the cinema. But increasingly, we're getting a lot of TV shows that are being shown on the on the big screen as well. So, yeah, I think it's a, a it's an interesting kind of um, blurring of the lines between the two. And I, the only other thing I would add, which is very clear blurring from the lines, is that TV shows now are often cinematic length, particularly end of season events like Westworld at the end of and a lot of Game of Thrones the last season. They're they're an hour and a half long. These are these are actually feature films, uh, yeah, <laughs> feature films. But that affects the way that they make the the show because. Um, one of the big, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll always go off and digress here, one of the big and I think good changes on TV over the last decade has been moving away from this idea of it has to be, uh, if you've got a comedy show, it needs to be done within half an hour. Uh, uh, if it's, a, if it's a, a drama, then it has to be done in 45 minutes. That kind of thing we're moving away from, and it's actually now the art form takes as long as it needs to take and, and the that form I follows think, its function exactly that i think is a huge benefit because sitcoms you knew what the pattern was you could watch a friend's episode and you knew exactly what the, that the pattern was going to be there and it's the exact same pattern with the big bang theory or any other comedy show you could mention it has the setup it has the the, the main action then it has the final bit and you know where you are in it at any given time but now Actually, as you say, it's 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 a matter of the uh, the form following the function. Yeah, so it's it's actually how much time do we need to tell the story that we want to tell? You look at and David I Lynch, think... Twin Peaks: The Return. It's essentially an eighteen-hour movie, and people are playing it in theaters now, just like an eighteen-hour experience. And it's just it, it's a very exciting time for the. The, the language of visual storytelling is going through a period of rapid evolution right now, and I feel like the best attitude to adopt is always to embrace the technological changes, because if you don't, you just kind of get, let, I mean, movies and television are always evolving. It's a technological medium. And I, I think the smart filmmakers, guys like David Cronenberg, they always lean into those changes as opposed to resisting and fighting them. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, Stephen Lucy, thank you so much for the super chat saying, only just made it, but appreciation super chat. Thank you for all the great content. Especially enjoy your Patreon narrations of the Winds of Winter chapters. Uh, you're very welcome. So this is one of the things I do, uh, and thank you for the super chat. I, one of the things I do for my patrons, I, I've done um, narrations, audio narrations of the pre-release chapters from the Winds of Winter. Very cool. Those are good chapters. There are some really good and really interesting chapters that gives up give us a lot of hints about what's going to be happening uh, in in the winds of winter so if you're at all interested in that uh then yeah please do go and if you miss stannis baratheon he's still there check him out yeah <laughs> he, is, he absolutely is and george r. r martin has made a point of saying he is still very much alive which is uh i was talking about my pink letter video this is quite a crucial point there because according to the pink letter stannis is dead According to the pre-release chapter from the Winds of Winter, Stannis is very much alive. That's quite a clue as about the fact that is it actually uh, a, a real letter from, uh, from Ramsay. Um, let's uh, go to Leaf Underhill, I think who I saw um, in the chat earlier, um, saying, have you watched Outlander? That's something I'd recommend to people who like Game of Thrones. Now, Outlander is something I've never watched. I've had a few people recommend this to me. Um, 
it's as I understand it, this is like a time travel thing um, where you get uh, the main character starts off in 1940 Scotland and then gets cast back to I think it's the Jacobite re rebellion from like the 18th century. It gets good reviews, but have you watched it? I've got What's your six take? seasons deep, and at this point, it's yeah. a little overwhelming to try to get caught up. Uh, I think if someone's looking for a show to scratch their Game of Thrones itch, so I can't speak to the Outlander, but I saw the first uh, season of The Last Kingdom recently. And granted, that's based in history, not sword and sorcery. But The Last Kingdom is very exciting, and I'm going to get totally caught up on that before I think season five or four is on its way. But I really thoroughly enjoyed that, and I feel like if you're looking for, if you're jonesing for more Game of Thrones and you want moving image, Last Kingdom might be one of your one of your alternatives for scratching the itch, at least in the short term. Yeah, uh, The Last Kingdom is something that George R. R. Martin often uh, references when he's talking about things that other things that people might want to watch or yeah. read. In fact, and it's based on ten books by Bernard Cornwell. So yeah, if you like like the, the big giant deep dive into history, Bernard Cornwell is like George R. R. Martin, but just tackling actual historical events in, in your home country. Absolutely, and and he does very good, very readable. They're not as big as George R. R. Martin books. They're not as multi-layered, but in terms of a rattling good story, Bernard Cornwell is is fantastic. He did the Sharp novels as well. If you've ever if you've ever watched uh, Sean Bean in Sharp, uh, and if you haven't, why not? Because it's brilliant. Um, but he does uh, does a whole load of these uh, the historical novels, um, and uh, The Last Kingdom is uh, I think it's on Netflix um, at the moment, uh, and I think there's another series uh, on the way. Um, and it's very good. It's it's sort of like a, um, and I'm sure they wouldn't ever describe it as this, but it's sort of like a sequel to Vikings, if that makes sense, um, but from the other side. So you get Vikings very much from the side of the Vikings, uh, and we see them coming over and, and, and starting to attack what is Northeast England. When you get to the Last Kingdom, this is cutting to quite a few years later when the Vikings have been taking over all of England and the last kingdom is the last of these English kingdoms and how is it going to survive against the might of the Vikings coming. So, so that's the world we're looking at and it is really good. I would highly recommend it. Um, Jane, hi Jane, uh, from uh, Patreon says, any seasoned serial connoisseur and castle geek should surely be watching The Man in the High Castle engrossing from scene one twists and turns completely absorbing 60s time travel america nazis japan throw in a few antiques and brilliant cinematography an absolute must see final season starts next week now this is something i i watched the the first episode or perhaps the pilot episode of this a long time ago uh, and i have read the book um, fantastic story. This is a Philip K. Dick story, and I'm a huge Philip K. Dick uh, fan. Uh, have you ever got into The Man in the High Castle, James? Uh, it, to my eternal shame and embarrassment, my only exposure to Philip K. Dick was reading to Android Stream of Electric Sheep when I was planning a big giant Blade Runner episode of my podcast, Wrong Real. So he's, I know he's one of the giants of the 20th century. And I just haven't done my homework, and so you you, you found my Achilles heel in the world of sci-fi. Uh, well, with uh, Philip K. Dick, I would highly recommend you just buy a collection of his short stories and just dive in. It's, um, I mean, the thing most people know about him is that that, that you you cannot make a bad film from his stories. Uh, you you get do Android's Dream of Electric Cheap becomes Blade Runner. We can remember it for you wholesale became total recall he's got minority report there are so many great films that are adapted from his stories um uh, and i he was very much an ideas writer an idea science fiction writer you get some who are very character driven uh you get some who are very concept driven he was he was all about the idea and then he would push that idea all the way through but the man in the high castle effectively is an alternate history um but it's an alternate history where the people starting to realize that they are in an alternate history that's Interesting. The kind of the twist gotcha. uh, and so the, so they see uh and this is the kind of, and i don't know where the the show has gone with this because this is just a book um but it's the idea that you get 
uh, you get an America which was uh, half invaded by the Nazis, half invaded by the Japanese after the Second World War. Um, and uh, then people, uh, the, there's this newsreel from the, our reality when that didn't happen. And people are going, well, hang on, where, where, where do we go with this? We're in, we're in an alternate reality. How do we get to that reality? That's it an seems insanely cool better. concept. <laughs> And, and this is this is why you get, with Philip Gay Dick, all of his concepts just blow your mind every single time, um, uh, and so I love it. I loved the book. It was I think it was the only one of his to win a Hugo Award actually, which is criminal. Um, uh, but it's it's a brilliant concept and brilliant story. Um, and uh, from what I've seen of the show, yes, it's very good. And as I say, if the final season is out next week, then uh, it might be a good time to to get into it. Um, we've got one more question or one more comment from uh, Patreon. So now is the time, uh, we'll probably keep going for another 10, 15 minutes or so, but now is the time if you've got any more questions or comments, drop them into the um, uh, the chat now. Um, what uh, what I'll, I'll just sort of throw a sort of a, an open question to you James so we I, I came up with this list of, of shows and sort of dropped it on you is there anything that we've not been covering here that you really think that we should be keeping an eye out for it's never been announced as a possible show in development and I don't know if it ever will be but the books of R. Scott Backer are criminally unloved i feel like in the fantasy community and so far there have been seven and he's kind of taking a little hiatus to like build a house he's really into you know building things with his hands but it's if i were to kind of hand pick a writer to write fantasy the way i want to see it he writes the kind of fantasy that's my, my dream fantasy in terms of deeply disturbing deeply provocative highly philosophical insane world building incredible historical backdrop and for whatever reason, his books just do not sell. But mm. for fans, for fan, I mean, it seems like obviously your 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 audience loves and adores fantasy. So I would I take every opportunity I can just to throw his name out there because obviously Joe Abercrombie is incredibly good, and there's you know Stephen Erickson is incredibly good. There's so many great fantasy writers right now who are enjoying. We are we we live in a blessed era when it comes to that specific genre, and I just want our Scott Backer to enjoy some of the spillover from the popularity of the genre at this point. Yeah, I think uh, as is the way. So, so to take it where we started with this, I think was was to say, after Game of Thrones, which has shown that uh, there can be a big budget fantasy blockbuster TV show, which is the biggest show anywhere. All of the channels, all of the networks, are now trying to do their thing. And they're trying to do something which kind of builds off of that in some way that's the kind of the mix that i've been going on with and they are always trying to go for what seems to work best for them which may not actually be the best books one thing i've whenever this kind of subject comes up i'm always saying why is nobody adapting robin hobb uh with with the 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 farseer uh, trilogy and uh, the assassin's apprentice and all the rest of it that is so good um and it perfect for TV. Um, uh, but there are so many great um, book series out there that just have not been adapted. I think to take this back to where we were a moment ago, I think one of the big battles we're going to have coming up is the extent to which something is made into a film or it's being made into a TV show. Because uh, the, the film is slightly more limited now yes you could have a two two and a half hour film but that it, it might work for a novel but if you've got a series of novels are you going to want to sell the rights to that for a film or are you going to hold out for a tv show now the film always used to be the golden goose that everybody was wanting but the tv show now maybe that's even better bet if you're a writer how do you feel about dune being broken up into two films instead of a show because i feel like dune obviously has been done as a show in the past a show that people liked but Denis Villeneuve is doing these two movies of Dune. And my fear is that the, if the first one flops, we might see the second one kind of butchered or kind of hamstrung. But I've got a lot of anxiety about Dune. But I'm also very excited as well. 
Well, I mean, I don't have any particularly original views on Dune in, in as much as I think my view is the same as everyone else's. It is a masterpiece that has never been done right. Uh, and that is a tragedy. And that was the same for Lord of the Rings until uh, until we got Peter Jackson on board. Um, but it's... Uh, I, I don't mind it being two films, uh, honestly. I... I had assumed it was being filmed in the same way they did with the Lord of the Rings. Everything was filmed at once and then they'll just carve it up. But are they doing it one film and then waiting and then doing another film? That I would have to look up to confirm. My, my assumption was that they were shooting it all at once because it's just more efficient that way. And you just mm. you save a, a pile of money in terms of locations, actors, etc. I can't imagine that they would break up the shooting schedule because it just is not in the interest of the studio to do so. But yeah. Denis Villeneuve... I like his movies, but he's never made a runaway successful <laughs> movie like a big crowd pleasing Infinity War extravaganza. And Dune, it's a giant undertaking. The cast is extraordinary. You got Rebecca Ferguson in there and Timothy Chalamet and all these wonderful actors. And uh, you know, got um, uh, oh, I was Jason Momoa. It's a really good cast. I, it, there's all the potential in the world, but it's heady stuff. It's a concentrated brew, and I don't know if that'll translate to big box office if, if done well. But obviously, the books have sold millions and millions of copies, so clearly there's an audience. But yeah, it, I, but when it goes down to the film versus TV debate, that movie might be one of the deciding factors in terms of the future of some of these sci-fi and fantasy properties. Is TV the more natural home? And I think it probably is for June, to be honest. That's that's my take. I think it it, it is a big book. I mean. The book itself isn't massive. It's a big book, but it's not massive. But it covers so much ground. It For me, it works as a series. And there are obviously the sequels as well. So I think it would work better that way. But I don't know. It's it's a tough call. I, 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 I'm kind of holding it. I think it will probably look beautiful because everything he produces does. Um, I love, so he did the um, Blade Runner 2049. Yeah, that and Arrival which, and Sicario, yeah. but his films can be on the slow side. I've definitely heard snores. While people are admiring the beautiful photography, some people take a little nap. Yeah, I mean, it's a shame, but I think it will look beautiful whether whether that translates into a, an exciting film, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Genevieve Rivers, uh, over on Patreon, saying, hope it's all right that I have a video game recommendation. Um, Crusader Kings 2 is a grand strategy game where you play as the head of a dynasty and it has recently become free to play. There's a mod based on the books entitled A Game of Thrones. Um, it takes time and patience to get the hang of it, but it's a lot of fun. And I'd highly recommend it. So, uh, no, we don't tend to cover uh, video games on this channel, but if you're at all interested in that, um, uh, there you go. Crusader Kings 2 is now free to play. I was wanting to pick up on something in the chat. A few people have been talking about um, uh, the Dracula series, which... Oh, right, yeah, uh, BBC's got the new show, correct? Yeah, so, and I don't know whether this is just just BBC or whether they're doing it co with anyone else. Uh, the There is now a trailer out, um, which... I watched just yesterday, and I say uh, I thought it was pretty amazing. Not for the not for the squeamish, it has to be said, which works well as a Dracula thing. It's nearly done. It's going to come out over the Christmas period on BBC. Um, it is for those who don't know. This is it's going to be big budget. It's written by Stephen Moffat uh, and Mark Gatiss, who were the the people behind Sherlock. Uh, Stephen Moffat's also the guy who wrote uh, most of the best uh, new Doctor Who series uh, show uh, individual episodes, things like Blink. If you're if you're a Doctor Who fan, he did that or the Doctor Dance. That's my favorite episode. I'm not a, I'm not a yeah. Who connoisseur, but Blink is special. Yeah, and and so Stephen Moffat is a very good writer. Mark Gatiss as well. With him, they work very well together. Um, uh, Game of Thrones fans will know him as Tycho Nostoris. He's also an actor. Um, but uh, the what they're doing looks to be uh, an 
effort to actually do the book, not bring it into like a modern era, not try and add on extra layers to it, but just try and recreate the feel of the original book. Because no one's ever in. done that. It's been a, there have been a million attempts, but no one's ever done a faithful adaptation of Bram Stoker. Even the movie Bram Stoker's Dracula is not a faithful adaptation of Bram Stoker's it's not, Dracula. It's very good, but it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, apart from Keanu Reeves' accent, which we're going to leave well we alone. We'll leave that alone. Um, but uh, they, um, it looks just right just from the trailer you never completely believe trailers but it looks really really impressive as i say it's um uh on the on the trailer there was a, a thing with a nail that it, it made me squirm so I, I don't think it's going to be uh something for the faint-hearted uh which i am very glad about because it was the book that scared me most as a child when i read it I say and just the format of it is so cool from the variety of different points of view and how some of them are recording some are diary entries some are, some are letters but how you get this tale this giant canvas that's kind of or, or basically almost like a patchwork from all these different sources it's you almost feel like a detective kind of assembling this giant mystery as you read it and yeah i've read bram stoker's dracula a few times it's such i, I don't know if i'm allowed to cuss it's such an effing great book and it, got, it gets my highest possible recommendation and i hope they knock it out of the park i don't, I don't know when it'll make it to the states it's hard to watch a lot of bbc programming i'm thinking about getting one of those uh, vpns to uh, pretend like i'm a brit so i can watch some of y'all's shows in real time <laughs> well, I, I, as I understand it, they, uh, the BBC, as well as a couple of other big channels here, ITV and Channel 4, are launching, have launched BritBox, which is like uh, lots of British TV, uh, their version of trying to, to sort of get the Netflix market, but with just uh, British stuff. So uh, maybe that will uh, appear somewhere over on your side of the Atlantic at some point. But the BBC do seem to be doing a lot more now of co-productions with uh international um uh or generally um, american companies like his dark materials was done jointly with uh hbo um and i'm pretty sure that um good omens which was on amazon was also a co-production with the bbc as well and, and will appear on the bbc at some point soon so uh, i think it, it it seems to work well that kind of um uh co-production thing as well um uh, we had a super chat in from, he says, putting his glasses back on, uh, Heather Witt, uh, thank you so much, saying um, top five series to read. Love you, Robert. Thank you so much. That's very kind. Um, I think this is uh, probably a good uh, one to sort of wrap up with. Um, so we've got, uh, I'll, I'll throw this to you. You don't have to think of five. Uh, but in terms of series of books to read, where what would be your, your favourites? Just because I read them very recently, the first Law Trilogy, there's seven Joe Abercrombie books so far, but the first three, the first Law Trilogy is so much fun. I just fell into it. And I recently read Mark Lawrence's uh, Broken Empire Trilogy. That's l not for the faint of heart. It, the first book's I mean, the main character is a villain. So you, you go through a lot of dark territory, but if you like dark fantasy, uh, Prince of Thorns, King of Thorns, and Empire, e Emperor of Thorns, that's extraordinary stuff. Uh, as mentioned, the R. Scott Backer Prince of Nothing trilogy gets a strong recommendation. If you want sci-fi, The Expanse, I would push people there. And I'm just doing a quick glance at my bookshelf <laughs> to see if I'm <laughs> overlooking anything that I particularly love because I don't want to kick myself later on by overlooking something that I, that I absolutely love. I, I'll, I'll, I guess Night of Seven Kingdoms, that is a, it's short stories all put together, but Night of Seven Kingdoms, if you like George R. R. Martin and you've run out of stuff to watch and read, Check out the Duncan Egg stories because the Duncan Egg stories, I feel like, could be a marvelous television series in its own right. They're, and it's very light. It's, you can rip right through it. But yes, I'll say Night of Seven Kingdoms as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I would I would agree with a huge amount of that, actually. I, Duncan Egg stories always recommend when they come on. And I particularly recommend the uh, audio books narrated by Harry Lloyd, uh, who uh, I've gone on record many times. I think it's probably the finest. Uh, narrator to story match that I've I've heard in terms of audio narration, with the possible exception of uh, John. He played Viserys in the show, correct? He did, yeah. And uh, but he gets it absolutely right because Dunk, as a character, has got such a unique voice, um, and he can do that as well as doing the kind of the Targaryen arrogance when he needs to do a a, a Targaryen as well. It's uh, it's 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 an absolute tour de force. Um, 
So there's that. Obviously, uh, all of George R. R. Martin, Lord of the Rings, uh, Robin Hobb. I mentioned a while ago the the whole trilogy. It's like a trilogy of trilogies. Um, the the live ship uh, traders, the 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 Farseer trilogy, um, uh, and I think it's called the Fools trilogy. I can't remember the the last bit, but it's just it's. Um, it's so good, and I, I certainly remember. I, I think it's still on the front page of uh, all of the the that, that series. Is it's got the recommendation from George R. R. Martin that says uh, Robin Hobb is a diamond in a sea of zircons, <laughs> uh, which I think is a wonderful phrase, and 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 you can tell how much he enjoys and appreciates it. Uh, so I definitely go with that. I Jared Abercrombie, yeah, I read quite recently. Um, did very much enjoy that. A few others I would go with would be. The Have you ever Rivers read this? Liza Lock, Lock Lamora. I keep hearing that this is good. Oh. I, I bought it. Yes. I haven't read it yet, but I hear that it's astonishing. Absolutely. And I was about to mention that myself, actually, and I wish I could remember who wrote it off the top of my head. The Lies of Lock Lamora. Scott um, Lynch. Uh, ex yes. Um, uh, and then there's at least two more after that. Uh, it's it's a proper fantasy story, um, and with one of those, and I think you'll like it. It's one of those rogue characters that you, an anti-hero that you kind of love to hate, or perhaps hate loving. Um, uh, it's that you're on their side, uh, but at the same time, you you kind of think they're not really good people here that we're dealing with, but and maybe slightly not as bad as the other people. And it's just this uh, fantastic, um, I, I would call it a heist romp, but that probably doesn't really do it justice. It's 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 uh, really well written. Um, the uh, So the Rivers of London I started talking about as well, which is a, a fantastic sort of modern fantasy series based uh, in and around London, uh, which I would highly recommend. Um, uh, the writer's name, David Aronovich, I think it is. Uh, I would very much recommend you go and check that out as well. Um, okay, I think we are just coming up to uh, the, oh, uh, just having a quick flick through the, the chat. Um, Wesley Mons is saying, has the BBC aired War of the Worlds yet? This is something else that I could have mentioned. Uh, for those who don't know, so the BBC have also been making a uh, uh, an adaptation of the War of the Worlds. This is, uh, again, they are doing this as a sort of a proper book adaptation. So it's not like a modern thing, not like the Tom Cruise thing that came out a while ago. This is a set in the Victorian era adaptation of the book. It's not out yet. Uh, I, I There is a trailer which seems to imply that it will be out soon. Uh, and I am very much looking forward to it as well. So yeah, that's another thing which is, um, uh coming up soon uh having a quick flick through is there anything else you want to just sort of uh, mention before we sort of wrap up i just want to thank you for the invite love your channel so it's an honor to be a guest and just keep up the amazing work i, I love watching your shows well that that's very kind um do you want to uh just let people know again where they can find you on the internet on twitter at colrex i'm there day or night uh, my youtube channel geeking with james hancock i'm a podcast wrong reel and yeah if you need more of my shiny bald head ranting and raving <laughs> about these topics you will find it all there it's a very fine shiny bald head <laughs> Um, uh, James, thank you so much. I've I've really enjoyed this, uh, guys. It, I'd be re really interested in that this was a slightly different approach to doing a, a live stream, just sort of working through a few different things coming up. Do let me know in the comments below if you'd like to see more of this, or if you want me to be focusing back again on things like a Song of Ice and Fire and particular subjects, like Lord of the Rings or whatever. Um, I. I'd be really interested to hear your views. Um, uh, thank you to uh, my patrons. Thank you to anyone in the chat, the super chats. That's very kind of you. Um, if you're watching this uh, a little bit later then appearing somewhere up around here, there is going to be uh, a link to other live streams that I've been doing and something appearing over uh, uh, that. No, that way. Uh, there's going to be a link to uh, always it's, it's the wrong way around in front of me, which is why I get very confused. Uh, there will be a link to my Patreon page if you're at all interested in supporting this channel or getting access to some of the exclusive things I do for my patrons. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, James. Guys, I will see you again next week. I've got another fantastic guest lined up for next week. I know you're going to really love. Uh, take care, everyone, and I shall see you again soon.